What's up, everybody? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast with your boys, Matt Wolf and Joe Fear. Check it. Hey, hey, welcome back for another lovely episode of the Hustle and Podcast. Hustle and Podcast? <laughs> That's a new one. Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast. Brought to you by Evergreen Profits. Dot com. Today, we have a uh, very interesting guy. He has a colorful background, and it's um, it's very unique. And he's got into every position he's in, or maybe most positions, uh, in very unique ways. So it's uh, super cool. His name is John Corcoran, and he literally was one of Bill Clinton's writers in the White House yeah. at age 23. He was one of the first people to work at DreamWorks when Steven Spielberg was starting that company up. Mm-hmm. He did a lot of Hollywood stuff, lived that life. He was um, a lawyer for a bit. Lawyer. I mean, whole fun, uh, a bunch of cool stuff. Holds events all over the place. The fact of the matter is, he's going to get you thinking bigger. He's going to think, uh, get you thinking different. We're going to debunk Matt yep. and well, his introvertedness. <laughs> well, okay, so a big point of this conversation is we're going to talk about how to be a better networker. Um, when you go to live events like Trafficking Inversion Summit and things like that. And uh, he gives a lot of tips for how to connect with people and follow up with people and stay connected with people. And that's kind of the, the main point of the conversation. And uh, he's going to he's gonna debunk my introversion, I guess you could say. True version. All right. So let's get into it. See you All later. Right. See ya. All right, John. Thanks for hopping on the show here with us. Thanks, guys. Happy to be here. Cool, man. Well, we uh, yeah, we had the pleasure to attend one of your events last year in San Diego at Traffic and Conversion, but your event is called Rise 25. Um, well, I don't know if that was the event name, but that's your company name. It was a great event. I mean, you pulled out. Thank you, sir. It was like 200 people or plus, maybe? No. Yeah, more than yeah. That. It was crazy. It started as just like a dinner party, and then one thing led to another. We combined with a couple other groups, and pretty soon we had... 300 people, a hotel ballroom, and you know half the speakers from the conference. It was really cool. Yeah. Cool. Was that the first year you did it uh, around the Traffic and Conversion Summit? Absolutely. First year, yeah. Mm. But you know what? I mean, it's actually achievable. It's, it might sound crazy if you're listening to this, thinking like, oh, I couldn't just go to a conference for the first time and throw a pr party for 300 people. <laughs> but it's actually more achievable than you think. And even if you don't want to do something like that, you know, everyone goes to conferences and one of the best things you can do is just bringing people together. It could be three people over coffee or it could be five people over beers or over mm -hmm. dinner one night. And it's just a way to take a, an experience like going to a conference and take it a lot further. So I'm a big fan of doing that sort of thing. Well, and isn't it true too? The, the one who brings people together is then seen as the authority or at least the connector. You're so the then, hub. Yeah, yeah, man. So opportunities are just abundant, even if you're brand yeah. new to the scene. Yeah. I mean, the joke is, it's like, you know, you can organize a party that you wouldn't even merit an, an invitation to, you know, if you, <laughs> if you work hard enough at it, you know, you become the connector of bringing people together. And actually, I've gone to conferences where we organize a dinner like the night before a conference happens. And that's a great night to do it because a lot of times there's nothing going on but people are already in town and they're waiting for the thing to start. They're looking for something to do. You can even get some of the other speakers to come. So right. speakers you wouldn't get you know, much time with if you came up after they spoke and, and spoke to them then. But you know, it, c contacting them in advance and inviting them to something where they can connect with other speakers is not just about you, but it's about connecting with other speakers and other you know, people who are coming to the conference, maybe even other people in the local community. And you can get a lot more FaceTime with some of the key players than you would otherwise. Love it. Yeah. I mean, we actually put on um, events, what, maybe two or three times a year here in San Diego. So we're definitely mm -hmm. going to circle back around of that and, and chat about the event stuff but before we dive too much into that kind of stuff i actually want to talk about your background a little bit because we we read some of your bio before we jumped on here and it kind of feels like you've lived multiple lifetimes already with <laughs> with sort of the, the stuff you've done i mean you've worked in the white house you've worked at dreamworks you uh, worked you were a lawyer i mean can you kind of uh give us the the real quick brief like um timeline here <laughs> Yeah, the short version is I just have ADD and I have to jump from one thing to the next before I get bored. <laughs> but um, no, I mean, I started my career uh, in the entertainment industry and in politics. So um, I grew up in LA where the entertainment industry is kind of everyone's in the industry. And uh, I was an early employee of DreamWorks working on one of the early TV shows that they did working for Steven Spielberg, Jeffrey Katzenberg and David Geffen, which was really cool. It's kind of like the Tesla of its day it was the hot <laughs> startup at the time. And kind of parlayed, I, I made a career of parlaying one thing into the other. <laughs> and the, the great lesson to that is, you know, oftentimes people try and they try and keep their head low and just kind of fit in with the crowd. But oftentimes when you 
are stand out and you do something different and you leverage the thing that's memorable about you and that that will create great opportunities for you so when i was applying to be a you know you mentioned as a writer in the in the clinton white house um yeah i was 23 years old i was i had a ba in english from a party school i, I hadn't gone to harvard i didn't have a law degree or anything like that at that point in time and so i didn't i wouldn't have really stood out especially if i was like someone applying from capitol hill but i was this guy who was coming from dreamworks in los angeles and so by parlaying one thing into a completely different industry i had that kind of cachet and it ended up opening the door to that opportunity so i, I say that to people all the time is like Embrace what is memorable about you because there's a lot of people in this world. There's eight, nine billion people in this world. Embrace what is memorable and people are more likely to, you know, think of you when it comes time for opportunities. That's that's interesting. What's a good exercise? And then I want to ask a little specifics about how you parlay things together too. Um, but how would you uh, teach someone or at least prompt someone to figure out what that quality is for them? What's memorable about yeah, them? Yeah, Exactly. Yeah, you know, uh, it's a great exercise is just simply going around and asking your friends, your clients, um, you know, asking them what is most memorable about you. Uh, Googling yourself is another good one too, <laughs> um, or you know, just testing it as you as you meet people. You know, we're constantly having to do some version of our elevator pitch and tell people about you know what our background is. So you know, just testing it from time to time and telling people what you know, uh, different little tidbits about our background and mm -hmm. seeing what, just reading people's faces and seeing what kind of resonates with them. You know, for example, I kind of, for many years, I've jokingly referred to myself as, I was a writer in the in presidential letters and messages, and I'll just say, you know, I'm kind of like a second tier speechwriter, <laughs> or I'll say kind of like a second string speechwriter. Uh -huh. If one of the speechwriters pulled a hamstring, then we'd step in. You're the bench and warmer, I, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and, and I'd say things like that, you know. And I remember once I was at a party, and I and I described myself in that way, and then like a half an hour, an hour later or something, some other person was like introducing me to someone I'd already met, uh -huh. and that other guy I'd already met was like, oh yeah, yeah. He's like the second string speechwriter. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. You know, and it was funny because it was self-deprecating, which yeah. is a good thing. You know, one thing you, if you have something that's considered an accomplishment and you want to be memorable for it, you also want to make sure that it, it's not intimidating to people. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. like it's a blessing and a curse to have gone to Harvard. Have you ever noticed someone who goes to Harvard? It's like you ever get, <laughs> get into a conversation with them. You're like, hey, so where'd you go to college? They're like, oh, in Massachusetts. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, really? Where? Oh, just, you know, outside Boston. <laughs> oh, really? Where? Oh, uh, you know, in Cambridge. It's like, <laughs> what? I know where you went. I know you went to Harvard, dude. You know, <laughs> so, stop lying. Yeah. Stop hiding so the fact. It's good to have something that's a little bit self-deprecating when you have something that's also an accomplishment, because if you if you state it, Sometimes even just stating it like Harvard can be seen as, well, isn't he conceited? You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, right. it's, it's a fact. He went to Harvard, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of so. like, like Tim Ferriss. His, his whole thing was he used to tell people he sold drugs on the Internet because he, yeah. sold, he sold supple <laughs> supplements nice. and, and things. Yeah. That would always start right. off a conversation, I guess. But no, I mean, that's yeah. that's great advice because I think one thing that I know I personally do is when somebody asks me, so what do you do? I tend to say, well, that's a tough question. And. Uh, and then proceed to give them a 15 minute explanation of all the various things that I do in my business. And then by the time the conversation's over, they have a glazed over look in their eyes and they're like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to go talk to somebody else now because like, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I mean, it's like now, I mean, I, I say I'm a recovering lawyer and a lot of times people are kind of like, Oh, ha, ha, what does that mean? Like, what do you actually do? You know, but at least it's memorable, you know? Right. And that's, I yeah. guess that's what you're looking for. It doesn't need to be a list of things. Just find that hook. What's that one thing to just kind of step out of the crowd and, and you know, look different? I, I met a woman at a conference a couple of years ago who told me, she said something to the effect of, I'm a dream catcher or <laughs> I'm a, a dream hunter or something like that. And, and she was basically like a life coach or like a business coach, sure. but she helped her clients to achieve some really big dream, like going on an eight week vacation with their kids or, you know, taking a six month around the world journey or something like that. Hmm. And I love the way that she just positioned that. And it was really cool. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Okay. So I'm curious though, going back really quick to the white house thing, being 23 years old, you didn't have your, your joke as being, you know, a recovering lawyer or second string <laughs> script writer. Uh, yeah. How did you land that gig out of the whole, you know, out of the sea of people probably trying to apply? 
Sure. Yeah. So um, I had been an intern in the speechwriting office while I was in college, and there are thousands of interns, at least back then there was, there still are thousands of interns that work in the White House. They, the White House depends on a lot of labor from, from interns, and you, you come through a college program, which is what I did, and um, you know, do an internship for three or four months, and then you go home. And the thing is, you know, lots of them would like to get a job at the White House, but not many of them do, or, or not a lot of them do. And so the question was, how do you parlay that into an actual job? And for me, it was, you know, trying to just deliver value as much as possible to the, the key people that I had built relationships with. So, you know, it starts with doing a good job. You got to do a good job. Mm-hmm. You got to impress them with your work ethic and, and your abilities. And then beyond that, what can you do to go above and beyond? And so when I went back, that, went back to college, it's not like I just completely forgot about them. I was looking for opportunities to remain top of mind with the speechwriters. And I would see speeches that I would copy or I would send to them, or I would see different articles that I thought were relevant or a poem or, mm-hmm. a, you know, a bit of scripture or something like that, that I thought that they can integrate to make their lives easier. And I would send them back. And because of that, when an opportunity came along, it was one of the speechwriters, his name's Lowell Weiss, uh, heard about uh, a, a writing position. And he contacted me and said, hey, you know, I heard about this position and I was top of mind. And I, you know, continued to remain in touch with him. And that's how the opportunity came along. Love it. Yeah. And being top of mind is so damn important. Mm-hmm. I mean, for anything, it's just... it. it like I do a little a little trick anytime a, a good friend of mine has a birthday or even maybe it's a client or just some colleague. Instead of going on Facebook and saying happy birthday, I send him a text, you yeah. know, and get a little bit more personable. You get out of the clutter, but you're more like, you know, they're obviously yeah. going to respond to you. Yeah. And, you know, it's a great point. I mean, some people will say like, oh, you should write a card or a personal note or something like that. Most people these days don't even do that. I say do whatever is most accessible to you and that you're actually going to do. So if you're actually going to send a text, then send a text. You know, it's better than not doing anything at Mm -hmm. all. There's one more really interesting lesson about how I got the White House job that's, uh, I think, uh, uh, a good lesson for your listeners is I had heard from Lowell. He told me that there was this position. He said that the person who was hiring for it might give me a call any day now. And so uh, the person ended up giving me a call about three or four days later. And when she gave me a call, she said, you know, hey, I want to get a copy of your resume. I want to hear about, you know, your background. I want to get some writing samples, you know, just all these sorts of things. And I said, okay, great, great, great. I can send all that stuff to you. And actually, you know what, if you don't, you don't mind, if you want a writing sample, you can open up today's New York Times. (laughs) If you look at the op-ed page, I have a letter to the editor that was published today. Perfect. (laughs) It was a little bit of a coincidental timing. But I'd sent that letter in a couple of days earlier, knowing that I might be getting this call and knowing that I might just nail it on mm-hmm. the timing. You know, it might come happen just around around the time that she contacted me and it happened to work out that way. If she called me the next day, it probably would have been an you know a letter to the editor in Akron newspaper or something like that. But You're it just like, happened to yeah. be the New York Times, which worked out really well. So my point behind that is, if you have some kind of big opportunity coming along to you. Don't just lay down and let it happen to you. Take control. Mm. Take action. What can you do in order to position yourself for ultimate success in what it is you want to happen for you? Very cool. Now, you know, I I have a sort of follow-up question to, to the same discussion. When it comes to opportunities, I'll tell you that one of the things that Joe and I struggle with in our own business is... In abundance of opportunities. I, I think there's probably some people listening to it going, oh, that sounds like a real tough problem to have. But we have literally uh, like people contacting us on almost a daily basis with opportunities of things they want us to get involved with with them. And I'm curious because I imagine with the, the sort of life you have and the networking and the, all the stuff that you do, you have something similar where there's just an abundance of opportunities flowing your way. Do you have any sort of filters or any way of, of uh, saying no, of, of <laughs> figuring out which ones are the ones to go with and, yeah. and saying no to the I, ones that are, you know what I mean? I was, I was literally having the, I've had this conversation probably five times in the last three days. So <laughs> this is absolutely relevant. You know, this is something that you, you have to deal with and you know, someone might be listening listening to this and thinking, boo hoo, here's the world's smallest <laughs> violin. Right, you know, right. uh, I don't have all those opportunities that I can't even relate to this click. I'm going to listen to another podcast. But the <laughs> truth is, you know what? This happens at every level where you have distractions. I remember when I was graduating from uh, law school, I was graduating from law school and I had no real business to speak of at that time, didn't have a job or anything like that. And I would go and volunteer, I would go to like, to like these nonprofit organizations that I was kind of interested in getting involved in. And they would ask, they would invite me to join the board. 
And it was because there was this guy who just graduated from law school and how mm-hmm. useful would it be to have a lawyer on our board? Mm. And it was very tempting, but it was distracting ultimately from what I wanted to do. And that happens for all of us where there are distractions, opportunities that come along and it's not aligned with what our ultimate goals are. What I think is tremendously helpful is having good uh templates that you can use that are polite, that you've written in advance, that you can use over and over again, that allow you to release a little bit of that guilt that you have from turning people down, but in a very nice, polite way. And I've got a couple of those that I use. And actually, if any of your listeners want to just email me, um, I'm happy to share them. I don't have them set up on a landing page or anything like that. John at Smart Business Revolution, they can email me and I'll send it to you. Cool. Um, but I use those and that helps tremendously is just being able to, um, you know, get, you know, turn someone down in, in a polite way. The other thing that I do, which takes a little bit more effort, <laughs> is what can you and actually this can be a real win win. How can you then pay that forward? Because, you know, the opportunity that you don't want to take advantage of someone else might. Right. So, right. you know, for example, I get a lot of invitations to be part of like, let's say a virtual summit or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, right now with all the commitments that I have, I, I turn them down. But on the other hand, there are other people, clients of mine, friends, colleagues, peers who would be happy to take advantage of that because they would like to use it. And then maybe they're going to leverage it in a really smart way that I'm not set up to do right now. Mm. So who else can you introduce that person to where rather than just saying no, you actually help them out and they will really appreciate that. Really appreciate that. I mean, I've had people that years later come to me at a conference or something and they say, you know what? I invited to be, you know, to do whatever. And, you know, you turn me down, but you introduced me to this other person. We really hit it off. It was a great fit, you know? And so that makes a big difference. Yeah. And that's, that's being the connector and, and, you know, that's almost more important than actually being in the role itself, you know? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. How how do you decide what, you know, what, what opportunities you will go with? You know, I think there's always that kind of like slight fear too of like, I'm going to turn something down. And then two years later, it will have turned out to be Uber that I turned down. You know what I mean? (laughs) (laughs) Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a tough one, right? I mean, my bit, my current business partner, Jeremy Weiss and I, we, uh, you know, he contacted me in, in 2015. Uh, we were both going to the same conference and he was coming into town a couple of days earlier and said, Hey, would you organize a little small group mastermind with me about a dozen people? And at that point in time, most, most of the time I would turn that sort of thing down. Um, it was just, you know, I, I, it was something that would be time consuming for whatever mm-hmm. reason I said, yes, I just thought, okay, this isn't too much of a time commitment. This seems like a good guy. I didn't know him that well at the time. And I said, yes. So sometimes you do have to have those opportunities that come along. On the other hand, I'm a big believer in goal setting. So setting clear goals for yourself and constantly judging any opportunity that comes along through that filter. Hmm. is this opportunity going to help me with the goals that I've set myself? Or is it going to take time and energy away from achieving those goals and actually prevent me from actually hitting those goals? If you're still hitting your goals and these opportunities are coming along and they're helping you to hit those goals that you set for yourself, that you've determined in advance, then by all means do it. If not, then you got to give them a polite decline. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. We, we, you know, we've had this discussion, Joe and I, so many times about the concept of, of a North Star goal, right? <laughs> of you know the this one sort of thing, and and the 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 sort of example we always give is someone like a Gary Vaynerchuk, whose goal is to one day own the New York Jets, or yeah, um, Bill Gates, whose goal is to like eradicate diseases off the face of the planet yeah. right they've or got elon musk you know <laughs> populate mars, mars yeah. right yeah, that, I mean, that's another one that we always reference it's like they have exactly. these giant massive goals that they're shooting for and so now every little thing that comes up they can put through the filter of does this get me closer to that or farther away from that exactly right and i mean i would even argue if you compare those you know uh, uh gary vaynerchuk looks a little uh, petty <laughs> that's, true. Yeah, that's right? true that's like, true <laughs> right? and it doesn't and does that really inspire people around you you know i mean i, I don't want to diss the guy i've had him on my podcast he's he's a, a nice guy and everything mm-hmm. and he's charismatic and people are drawn to him as it is but you know let's say the goal is a little bit different you know i mean tony robbins his goal is to feed uh, provide 100 million meals or something right. like that the yeah. hungry people you know that rallies people around you elon musk too is he's not a great boss he's a tough guy to work for mm-hmm. and he's not charming charismatic in person i've met him once he's not that charming charismatic at all in person <laughs> but he gets people to buy into his vision you know this big 
vision that he has. And so, yeah, I think it's tremendously powerful to have a North Star like that. Yeah, and that's it's ironic because we know what the North Star is, but it's like, how do we figure out our North Star? I mean, we we definitely have done a ton of goal setting and this is this is definitely going down our own rabbit hole, so we won't have to go here. But <laughs> I think it's relevant for your listeners too, though, yeah. too, because everyone struggles with that. You know, what is the big goal? And it might change. I mean, you know, if you're yep. struggling right now to get clients in the door, you got to focus on that. You know, exactly. But having that bigger vision is not going to detract from getting clients in the door. Having that bigger vision is going to get more people in the door. Hundred I mean, percent. We had yeah. we had a guy who came to one of our Rise Twenty Five events, and one of his big priorities was helping. You know, he he had, he had uh, immigrated to this country at age 15 on his own wow. and come and live for a re- with a relative. Didn't even go to high school at the time, and he was kind of a younger guy. Didn't even go to high school, and he actually worked as a janitor for like three or four years until <laughs> he could get his butt in school and then go to school at nights while still working. I mean, what a great story! Wow. And then he turned it around, and he was committed to helping foster kids and helping young impoverished kids. Uh, and teenagers and getting them on on the right path and and he that mission though was not really integral to the business that he ran mm. and so we encouraged him to make that a part of it because let let everyone else rally around that and let even people who refer business to you think you know I'm supporting this guy who supports this organization and that makes me feel even better that he's doing that mm. well, I can connect with that one because I do foster a kid right now so <laughs> that is uh yeah good for well, you there Very we go cool. so that can that's lead awesome. to a north star <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. a great north star it so, is. Yeah, I mean yeah. we can't all be you know yesterday as we're recording this yesterday spacex just landed their yeah. took, launched their their falcon heavy uh rocket the the most powerful rocket in over 40 years and i i, I couldn't even concentrate yesterday i was so excited oh, yeah. about <laughs> it yeah and um, you know it's amazing freaking. but we can't all do that right i mean I, you know part of me this morning as i was biking to work i biked my kids to work oh wow and i was and i was thinking you know um man, like, oh, man, how do I, I feel like crap? Like Elon Musk is doing these amazing things <laughs> in the world. We can't all do that, you know, yeah. but we can have an impact on our local community. We can foster a kid. We can support another family or someone who's doing good work. I mean, I live up near wine country, north of San Francisco. My wife works up in wine country. Mm-hmm. She had her school. She works at a community college, 600 kids, uh, students lost their homes. Mm. About five dozen colleagues um, lost their homes. And rather than like having it be overwhelming, she just focused on three other families and helping them to rebuild. And then others in our community were able to donate, you know, material, furniture, clothing, which we collected. And then she gave to those three families. So that's one Mm. small concrete thing that you can do. I love it. No, that's that's great. So everybody can have a North Star and it can evolve over time. Yeah, depending on where you're at. Well, cool. Let's um, let's chat about because prior to this call, we we had a little uh chat with Matt, and uh, because you you know you hold Rise Twenty Five, your events. Um, let's quickly actually discuss about what Rise Twenty Five is. Um, kind of the things you're trying to serve there. I know it's the one to many approach uh, yep. to professionals, and then I want to kind of debunk Matt really quick <laughs> and his uh networking abilities here. <laughs> 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 sure. Sure. Yeah. So uh, Rise 25 kind of originated out of Jeremy and I, as I mentioned earlier, did a small group event together before conference. It was about a dozen people. We really liked it. We got feedback from the people who came. We found ways we could improve it and we kept going and we just really enjoyed doing it. And they've gotten bigger and bigger. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, the, the VIP reception, we had a traffic conversion summit conference last year, had about 300 people. We expect about three, three, 300, 400 people this year. Um, and we continue doing them. And, and our market is kind of evolved. We kind of have two markets right now. Right now, we're, we, we should generally advise everyone against doing. Right. <laughs> but but what, the primary market is professional services. People like, I, I, you know, I'm a recovering attorney. So people who are trading hours for dollars who want to get away from that and want to leverage their time better um, and do something one to many. Mm-hmm. And then we also are also working with e-commerce founders too, which sounds a little bit uh, different. Um, but they have similar types of challenges and we're holding an event in Las Vegas in March in conjunction with the Prosper Show conference where we're doing VIP days for their highest level attendees. So those mm-hmm. are kind of the, the primary things we do. Got it. And so the, the main the main reason for the event is to is it is it for you guys to to network and meet more of these types of people that can potentially become clients? Is it to just bring people together? I mean, what what's the motive for from a business standpoint to put these events on? Everything, every, you know, 
whenever I've thought too much or focused too much on me, 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 what I can get out of anything, um, that's when things have failed. When mm-hmm. I just focus on helping other people, bringing other people together, bringing, making connections, connecting people so that they can have some time together, then the benefits will flow from that. And so that's just what we focus on. You know, for years, I wrote a blog and a podcast, Smart Business Revolution, where I talked about strategies for building better relationships in business. And now just what started with doing small little dinners and events has grown and become bigger and bigger and and do larger events where we're just doing the same thing. We're just trying to connect people together, introduce them to one another and foster great relationships so people can go off and do great things in the world together. I love it. I mean, that's all the reason why we should hold events of any kind, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because yeah. Matt yeah. and I actually run an event and, uh, you know, and, and there was a purpose behind it originally, but then kind of recently the purpose has changed. So we're just like, okay, so what, but, but exactly what you said, it's bringing people together and it's people we enjoy. They bring their friends, new opportunities or people, you know, meet each other. Yeah. It's just yep. good, good things happen. Yeah. So a little bit about our event, just real quickly, is we we put on these events. Uh, I mean, we don't really Quarterly have a really consistent a consistent schedule, but we shoot for once a quarter. But basically, we're we're sort of beer nerds. Uh, San Diego has a very <laughs> thriving brewery scene, and we've always loved craft beer, and we're we're sort of nerd we nerd out about brewing. So we actually go around to different breweries in San Diego. Oh my god, I'm in love. And we put <laughs> on business networking events in the breweries. The breweries oh, love to have us. Geez. Where do I sign up? Seriously, we're we're you know we're um, we're well we brew on their system. We brew on their system, so we actually go in and make a unique beer with them just for our event. So we do this about two weeks before the event. We make a unique beer with them, and then we market the event, and then we bring a bunch of business owners out to their brewery. So the brewery gets more exposure. The business owners get to network. Um, the brewery's making money off it. I mean, we we and you're drinking beer, and we're that drinking does not beer and suck ne- at all. Yeah, I mean, we we That's literally we have paid. no yeah. twist twist my arm. <laughs> the, the, you know, there's no financial gain from it for us whatsoever, other than we're helping out breweries and we're meeting new people. Um, but. It's always it's it's kind of funny because I did sort of hint earlier, and I think we talked about this before we hit record. Was that I'm ultra ultra introverted, so I have to, you know, it usually takes me like two beers before I like I even open my mouth at a networking. And event. it's really <laughs> ironic because Matt's the one that really loves to talk a lot. Well, when on, it comes to the podcasts podcast. and stuff like that, you can't shut me up. But when I'm face to face with people, it's a different story. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And you so. know, sometimes that means you know, adapt your business so that it plays to your strengths, right? You know, I mean, I often say to people, like people say to me, like, should I start a podcast? Well, that depends. Do Mm -hmm. you like talking to people? Do you like interviewing people? If you don't, then don't do it, right? Right, right. You know, or find a way that you can use your strengths. If you're really chatty and talkative and doing a podcast, then maybe that's a good strength (laughs) for you. Yeah, it's interesting that the podcasting actually started out as sort of a challenge to myself because I didn't really make an effort to network and meet new people and, you know, go out and expand my business contacts. And so this was a sort of exercise in getting out of my comfort zone. I just need to get out there and talk to people. And this is my way of doing it from still being sort of in my own safety bubble. (laughs) And, um, you know, over time, I obviously just got more and more comfortable with it. But um, yeah, I mean, as far as the events go, still to this day, even when we put on our own events, I'm very not in my comfort zone. (laughs) Yeah, you know, and that's fine. You know, that happens. You know, I think that what you do is just find ways that you can adapt. And you know, sometimes the problem, you know, people will say, I'm introverted. I don't like going to networking events. Sometimes the problem, and I don't know if it's the case with you, but with other people maybe is they're going, they haven't really figured out what the larger picture is here. And the events that they're going to are not really aligned with what they ultimately want to do. Maybe they're going to conferences that are for their current employer, for their current job, and it's not, it doesn't really light them up anymore. So you really got to kind of take a couple steps backwards and get really clear on what's the ultimate goal here. What do you want to do? If you have your own business, is it does it need to evolve in some way? So you're not really lit up. And, and oftentimes, you know, the reason that we are not excited about going to an event or not excited about meeting people is because of... We're, we're not meeting, we're not in the right room full of people, mm, right? Mm-hmm. And then once you get in that room full of people, then that can improve a lot, make it a lot less painful in order to, you know, connect with those people. The other thing I'll say is that some of the best people out there who I know uh, built, out there building relationships for their business are introverted. 
And I'll take mm -hmm. an introverted person who follows up and who's consistent and who develops relationships and put a system in place over an extroverted person who doesn't do any of those things any day of the week. Because mm -hmm. you have some people that are like big and boisterous and they're at a party and, you know, they're slapping people on the back and other people are laughing and it's all this kind of stuff. And they're making a big impression right then and there. But then they don't follow up at all, you know, mm -hmm. and th that's not going to get them anywhere. You know, and then when they do need something, then they come around a year, two years later, and that's when they're asking when they haven't done anything to build or nurture the relationship. Whereas like the, you know, an introvert maybe is, is totally cool with after the fact, sending an email and following up to someone that they met with, met at an event and saying, hey, really enjoyed meeting you. And then maybe finding some way that they can further that relationship. You know, maybe it's, I'm a big fan of interviews. What we're doing mm -hmm. right here now is a great way to further a relationship. So, yeah. you know, doing a podcast interview or interviewing someone, profiling them in some way on a blog or an article or something like that is another way to further the relationship. But look for those opportunities and then be consistent about following up. And that will often overcome what we consider limitations from introversion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the podcast really was our sort of way to systematize networking, so to speak. You know, they, it was our system to once a month make sure we're reaching out and talking to new people we've never talked to before. And I mean, that is legitimately one of the top like three reasons we created the podcast oh, was, yeah. was for that. Now, when you do... Yeah, it's huge. Do, so at networking events... I guess everybody's going to have like a different strategy to it, but are you more of like a, a work the room type of guy or do you go and find one or two people that you want to just kind of hone in on? These two people are the people I'm probably going to, um, you know, I'm, I'm here to meet these two people for this specific goal or do you try to like work the room and talk to as many people as possible when you're at networking events? Well, it depends. If there is a list of attendees that's published in advance, then I'll try and find that and look at who's coming so I can strategize a little bit the people that I really want to talk to. If I don't know at all in advance who's going to be there, then you might try and contact someone when you get there and find out who's there. Um, I'm a big fan of sometimes going to an event and trying to help out. Mm -hmm. Like checking people in at the door is a great way to get to know every single person in that room. And that can help mm -hmm. with some of the anxiety because you've met everyone. You're not going into a room where you don't know anyone. Yeah. And you can just go back up to the people that you checked in and, and have a conversation with them. Um, you know, beyond that, the, the thing is, sometimes you don't know where a relationship is going to lead. Right. You know, that you've met someone and you don't know what the long term potential is with it. You That's know, true. and so you kind of got to let these things shake out a little bit further into the future. You know, it might, it might turns out that there are other opportunities. That's why I'm a big fan of going afterwards and finding some way of following up with them, doing an interview or something, because then you can get them to know them in a deeper way. Oftentimes at these, you know, networking events in person, you've got, you know, hundreds of people in the room. Maybe it's really loud. Uh, it, and maybe that's kind of intimidating and you talk to someone for a couple of minutes. That's it. You know, it's hard to really get to know them in a deeper way. So if you can find some way to follow up with them, then you can get to know them in a deeper way and figure out if there is some opportunity for collaboration because there's not going to be collaboration opportunities with everyone, mm -mm. right? I mean, it's a big world. So we're not going to be able to collaborate with everyone. So, you know, just look for that excuse. The other thing I'll say is that look for some way that you can follow up. So when I'm talking to someone, I'm looking for, okay, what does this person need? What's you, what could they use help with right now? Is it a recommendation? Is it an in introduction or something like that? So that I have an excuse to follow up. So I have an excuse to say, hey, what's your contact info? What's your email address? I'll follow up and I'll send you that resource that we just discussed. Yeah. I think that's a, that, that, what you just said there. I guess I've always kind of done unconsciously because that was how I grew. Because so Matt and I, yeah, we used to go to events all the time to grow our business initially. That's I had a service business, so it was all very one-on-one -on -one clients, um, you know. And I'm more the uh, extrovert uh, rather than that, you know, doing a lot of the work online. But yeah, in my head, I always thought of like how how can I help this person in some way? But the the reasoning was to follow up or have a further conversation, get to know them on a one-on-one -on -one scale. Maybe you're at a party. You can only get a few words in with them, but you're like, this person seems very interesting. I don't know if something develops immediately, but maybe a year down the line, something can happen. Yeah, you yeah. never know. I mean, the, how many people have you you know, met at something and it doesn't lead to an opportunity right then and there mm. or six months or a year or two, three years later until some opportunity comes along. Sure. You know, but what helps a lot is getting to know more about that person. Right. You know, because... You never know what's going on. It might it might be that their you know spouse 
needs help with something and mm -hmm. you can help out that spouse in a professional capacity. But I, I often urge people to not try and jump to the professional capacity first. So, you know, you'll see someone who's like they're a photographer or they are a CPA or something like that. And they're immediately looking for, OK, how can I deliver value? How can I get them into a conversation about what it is I do professionally? Right. Mm -hmm. And when you try and get into that too quickly, then that's when people are kind of off put by yeah. it, you know? So you, you, sometimes you want to slow that down and see, like, okay, where, how else can I deliver value to this person? You know, can mm -hmm. I give them a recommendation or a resource or something? One I love is just, you know, find out like, are, what are they, where are they traveling to this year? And if someone mentions they're going on vacation to Puerto Rico, you know, mm. oh, do I know someone in Puerto Rico I can introduce them to, mm, you know, yeah. or they, they're going on vacation somewhere else. I mean, maybe I've been there before and I can give them recommendations of places where they should go and eat, yeah. you know, restaurants they should go. In. It's just it. such, a, such a small little thing, but allows you to connect on a more personal level. Yeah, no, I mean, my, my least favorite question when I'm at networking events is what do you do? Because yeah. <laughs> like I said earlier, I usually am pretty good at getting people to like get their eyes to glaze over when I start explaining <laughs> what I do because I'm an entrepreneur. I'm I, At any given time, I'm involved in like five or six businesses. So it's it's a complicated question to answer and I absolutely hate answering that question. But if somebody was to come up to me, I mean, I have a, a, a buddy that comes to mind um, he may be a mutual friend. I'm not sure. His name is Ori Bengal. Um, he, yeah, he came to one of our events two months ago. <laughs> yeah, he. Uh, everybody knows him. He's yeah. one of the most yeah. well-networked people I know. That's why I yeah. assume probably everybody knew him. But the the way he introduces himself to people is he comes up to random people he doesn't know and just tells a joke. Mm -hmm. And mm. a lot of times they're just dirty jokes and people are caught off guard like, whoa, did he just say that? Um, <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> but, you know, instant rapport. You just had a laugh over something together. And, um, and it wasn't starting off with, so what do you do in business? You know? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I hate that question too. You know, <laughs> it's nice if you can wait for a while oh, <laughs> just before yeah. getting to that. Yeah. I'm curious. It, it's, oh. it's fine to know, you know, to, to get into that discussion, but not right away. Right. Yeah. What are your, um, since you've held so many dang events now, what are some of the, like, the worst networking things you've seen people do? I mean, I could imagine the first one is like shove a business card in someone's face too fast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much the worst is is trying to get someone into a, a sales conversation too quickly, you know, um, or, uh, you know, have you a, a discussion about one of the third rails of conversation like religion or politics mm -hmm. or something like that too quickly. You know, <laughs> right. you never know where people are coming from. Um you know, those are the main ones are just uh, not being open to a conversation, you know, um, it, yeah. it's hard to know because sometimes people are they're introverted as well. So they have have trouble opening up to other people. Um, and that can often be perceived by others as uh, the, the person being conceited mm -hmm. or not interested in having a discussion with someone. So I, I try and give people the benefit of, of the doubt when it comes to you know, in, in a networking event or something like that where people are a little bit uncomfortable. But you want to be cognizant of that, of, of the the image that you put off to other people because you might be intimidating. You might be putting off a really negative, you know, mm -hmm. Im image to people, uh, you know, because of... Uh, because of that, you know, it's like right. people talk about people's resting face, like having like a, <laughs> an angry resting face, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, you know, like you might have an angry resting face, and other people are like, "Oh, that that she's a she's a bitch." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Now, so how how are you with with names? Because obviously, that's a big thing with networking is people say, "I'm you know I'm bad with names," and obviously, there's a a self fulfilling prophecy element to that. But that is actually one thing that I've personally always struggled with is somebody will tell me their name, and like three minutes later, I'm like in my head going, all right, I just need to say, all right, it was good talking to you, bud. Cause I can't remember their name, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I am not great with names. You know, I, I, uh, you know, we meet so many people and I generally, it's like, I need to hear someone's name a couple of times before I'm going to remember it. Um, but you know, with anything like that, you know, everyone has some thing that they're, they're, insecure about or they feel like it's going to hold them back and it doesn't it doesn't need to hold you back most of these things are in our head mm -hmm. you know i mean i get emails from people on a daily weekly basis and people are talking about every different way they think that they have something that's holding them back and one person saying, oh, you know what, I, I'm, it's because I'm a woman or it's because I'm a man or because I'm old, it's because I'm young, it's because I'm disabled. You know, it's people have every different reason to believe that 
there is something holding them back. And that does not need to be the case. You, you know, you look at, you know, there are motivational speakers who have suffered horrible burns or who are disabled or in a wheelchair. And, you know, they just, they, they have a way of tapping in and realizing that it is the psychology in our head that holds us back. Mm. When I was 23 years old and I had a BA in English from a party school and I was interviewing for a job to write the president's words, if I'd let that hold me back, I would have said, what the heck am I doing here? I do not belong. Mm, but sure. I just said, you know what? I have confidence in my abilities. I know that I can perform up to the task and I can do this job. And that's what we all need to do, you know? And rather than dwelling or fixating on negatives or inabilities, focus more on your abilities and you know, laugh it off. Okay, I forgot someone's name or find some other way to figure out what that person's name is and you'll, you'll get past it. Mm, yeah, no, that's great advice. Um, so there's there's sort of one last small rabbit hole I want to go down with you real quick, and then we can go ahead and wrap it up unless there's yeah. something no, else Joe wanted to go into. But um, when it comes to the event, uh, the Rise 25 events, um, as far as like the logistics and actually putting on event, what what sort of things have you found to be the most difficult about putting on event? Actually, I'll just I'll stop at that question, then I'll have a follow up question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, far and away, getting people there, hmm, getting right. people to come, you know, inviting people, getting people to buy tickets um, is always the hardest. But in most events, there's kind of a tipping point and there are things that you can do in order to make it easier for yourself. Like if you're organizing a big conference, then a lot of times they try and get that marquee speaker yep. to lined up, you know, and that name will will draw a bunch of other people. Doesn't all that's not always the case. Doesn't always <laughs> happen that way. Sometimes you hear disastrous stories, <laughs> but you try and do that. Or if it's you know even like a dinner, you know, like a dinner at a conference where you're trying to get a couple of people together, getting those first couple of people to commit to say yes. Often you start with your friends or people that are know like and trust you. Get those to say yes, and then getting others after that. Got it. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. my, my follow-up question was going to be, and you, you kind of already sort of answered it, but what, what would be this, the best advice you would give somebody who's thinking about going and putting on their own events? You know, what, what sort of things would they think to, to keep in mind or, or, or should be thinking about before they go do it? Sure. Um, one, I would think about how are you going to make this profitable? Because anything mm. that you do, if it's not profitable, you're not going to be, be able to do it for long. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do it, then you can't have a bigger impact in the world. You know, mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. I, was, I was just earlier today, I was talking to a, a stand-up comedian. Um, and he had organized a couple of uh, small comedy shows. And he said, told me that he'd done a couple of them and he lost like $10,000 on it. He kind of like laughed mm. it off. And I said, look, man, you need to make these things profitable because you do an amazing thing. You bring humor to the world. You make people laugh. And in today's day and age, more people need to laugh yeah. because it's very, these are very serious times we live in. And if you go losing money on all these events, you're not going to be able to continue to do it. So how can we figure out a way to make that profitable for you? So I'd say the same thing with people. You know, Look, if you want to do live events, if you want to do some kind of event, whether it's small with five, 10 people or whether it's a, a larger one, start with something smaller, work your way up, but find a way to make it profitable. And that might mean that you need to charge enough in order to make it profitable for you or at least break even, but preferably profitable or you have some way to make it profitable on the back end, but find some way to make that that work, even if that means that you're going to get a bunch of people saying no, you know, you're going to mm -hmm. get a lower success rate. You, you know, you charge $9 and yeah, you might get a 90% say yes success <laughs> rate. You charge $100, $200. It's going to be harder to get as many yeses, but look, you're going to make it profitable and that's going to allow you to continue to do the things you do and to have the impact in this world. So that's what yeah, I would say. That's mm -hmm. great advice. One, one thing that's interesting too, is if you charge too cheap for it, people don't value it as much and may just not show up. We've noticed that with Absolutely. some of our events yeah, yeah. where we've charged $5 a head to get in and people just buy tickets in advance and then say, yeah, I'll decide if I want to go later. And yeah. we actually struggle getting people to show up when they paid so little to, for their ticket. So it's another. Right. That's a big factor. That's a big factor. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll even use that as, as a selling point with people. I'll say, look, this is not a cheap ticket to come to this thing. What mm -hmm. does that mean? That means you're going to get other people that are committed coming to it. And that means you're going to get people that are serious, that are running more significant businesses. And it also means that you're going to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, I went to a conference a couple of years ago, a number of years ago, where I'd never dropped this kind of coin before. It was like $7,000 for two days. Wow. Yeah. And 
I guarantee you, I took it seriously. I mm. showed up early. I made sure I met people. I followed up with people. I made sure I got ROI out of it. If it had been a hundred dollar event, I wouldn't have treated it the same way. Just to be quite honest about my own personality, you know. Mm -hmm. And and mm -hmm. most people are like that, right? That's, I mean, that's exactly, it's kind of ironic. That's how we shifted our business model. So instead of selling all these minute, you know, $100, $500 products, we're selling, well, it's only free or we're selling very high end consulting or some yeah. kind of partnership equity deals. So it's, we've seen yeah. massive improvements in the quality of work. It's more enjoyable and we're making more money. Hey, yeah, so yeah. I mean, <laughs> hey cool. that's a good thing. Right. <laughs> that, that advice definitely does not go for only events. I no. mean, I, I've hired consultants and coaches and you know, the, the, the most I've ever paid for a coach was $6,000. But you know, as soon as I paid that money, I got on the call with him and I, f and I followed everything he told me to the letter because I knew I need to get an ROI on this mm -hmm. or yeah. my wife was going to kick my ass, <laughs> you know? So, right. um, it, that that's definitely great advice that applies to pretty much anything in business. That's right. Yeah, um, it does. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, putting that kind of money down it takes it, you just take it so much more seriously, you yeah. know, you're going to, you're going to follow through on that stuff and, and make sure that you get an ROI out of it. Right on. Absolutely. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up, but um, I guess a couple of questions. I'm just curious if there's something that uh, maybe that, that you think would be beneficial to the audience here that we haven't asked. Uh, maybe there's, there's a question that you think uh, that, should, that should pop up. I don't want to stop um, you, though. <laughs> you know, this is a longer discussion, but we haven't talked, I don't think, about uh, time. Mm. You know, time. It, it, this is the number one objection you hear from people, whether no matter what we're talking about, but how do I get all this stuff done? I don't have enough time to get everything done as it is. Sure. And you can talk about tools and hacks and all that productivity, all that kind of stuff, you know, but bottom line, it boils down to priorities. You know, what are your priorities? And it gets back to that goals discussion we were talking about mm -hmm. there. What are the, what's the North Star? And then everything needs to flow down from the North Star to the other goals that you have for yourself on a, on a yearly and a quarterly basis and even down to a weekly or a daily basis. What are you going to get accomplished in this day and this time? They're going to help you to achieve the larger goals and everything else you can peel away because it's not really in service of that thing. So uh, that's a big one I just thought maybe we mm. could address. Um, because oh, of that i love it yeah no time is time is crucial and i i think that would be a long discussion <laughs> yeah, it would. That. do, you, do it you have any like quick i don't have the time for that discussion yeah. guys, i'm sorry <laughs> i was gonna say do you have any like real quick real quick tips that you can give i know one of them is you have i, I believe you have an assistant because i think we've been emailing back and forth with your assistant so i know that's that's at least going to be one of them but do you have uh do you have any more like just real quick tips for people that struggle with i don't have enough time um, yeah. Uh, so one that I often mention is, uh, especially if you feel like you can't afford an assistant yet, mm -hmm. uh, is to use a, 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 what's called a CRM software, customer relationship management. Not everyone does. A lot of people, you ask them, what's their customer relationship management software? They're like, do you mean my phone hmm. or do you mean my <laughs> Gmail? Yeah. No, like we have communication now with people across so many different platforms, Facebook messenger, email, LinkedIn, text message, phone, there's all these different platforms and using any one of them as our organized centralized CRM does not work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, most of them out there, the ones that are worth their snuff, you got to pay for. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's gonna be 30 or 50 bucks a month. So that we're talking 600 bucks a year. If you can't get ROI out of that, you're either not using it or you're doing something wrong. Right. So one of the strongest things I recommend for people is have a CRM that you can use to organize all the relationships in your life. We've got thousands of relationships in our lives. Now, you don't need to organize all of them. You need to practice an 80-20 approach and really focus on the ones that are most important, but use something like that. So I've used, you know, I use one religiously now. Um, it doesn't take a ton of time to do, and it will save you a ton of time. So a time like this, when I'm organizing you know, my, my event, my party in a couple of weeks in San Diego, I can just look up, I can look up on, you know, in, in my CRM and just sort it by people in San Diego or Los Angeles, and I can send an email, fire an email off to everyone in, you know, who's close by. And it comes out as an individualized, personalized, individual message, doesn't look like a big spam message that's sent to a bunch of other people, inviting them to the party. Mm. So that is a huge, huge time saver right there. So I, I'm a big fan of that. And what's that tool called? <laughs> I well for for me I use Contactually. Okay. I've um, used that. In others, the past, yeah. you know, there are other ones out there that you might use, but Contactually is the one that I've been using. Very cool. cool. No, oh, that's a that's an amazing use. And I feel like, yeah, there's just so many platforms and messaging 
going on just all over the world. Everything's so segmented these days. It feels like they're all competing against each other for attention, but then inherently you're, you might miss a super important connection or meeting or sorry, a message from someone who maybe has a cool opportunity or just wants yeah. to meet up for coffee. You I know? love it. So yep. good stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. And, and I guess a, a wrap up question. We always like to ask folks uh, what their go-to books are. Maybe there's something that they just really love to read you know, yearly, uh, something that you just recommend to other people? Um, the one that I frequently recommend is Give and Take by Adam Grant. Hmm. Um, okay. And he's a one of the youngest professors at Wharton. Um, he, you know, for, for the longest time in my own life, I felt like if you go out and you do good in the world, that the reward the the world will reward you. Mm -hmm. Well, what Adam Grant did is he went out there and he's a really a great writer and he tells all these great stories, but he backs that up with social science research and he found that basically if you are a giver rather than a taker, that is you are go out there and you try and help other people rather than just try and take 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 and get whatever you can, yeah. you are much more likely to rise to the top of the success ladder. Mm -hmm. And he gives examples across all kinds of different industries of how that plays out. And it's a really engaging, readable book. So I'm a big fan of that book. Love it. Yeah, that's a new one to me. So I'm yeah. going to definitely pick that one up. Um, all right. So the so the Rise 25 event, what's, what's the date of it? I'm going to do my best to get this episode out before <laughs> that happens. So what's the date of the next Rise 25, the Traffic and Conversion Summit one? Yeah, great. So it is Sunday, February 25th, as we're recording this on the 7th, about... Uh, 20 days away, 20, 18 days away yeah. or something like that. Cool. And it's a, uh, it's a, a VIP reception. We're going to have, um, we, last year we had about half the speakers there. If anyone's interested, email me, uh, again, John at smart business revolution.com and we'll see what we can do. It depends on capacity issues, right. yeah. depending on when this is published. Very cool. Very cool. And then where, where would you want people to go after listening to this episode? You know, what, what website do you want them to check out? Do you want them to follow you on social media? What, what do you want sure. to do next? Yeah, people, you know, people always like getting a freebie. So what people often like to grab is I've got a, a, some free email templates for uh, connecting with the influencers and, and VIPs in your world. Actually, come to think of it, I could even add into that email template, the, uh, the polite decline templates yeah. that we were just talking nice. about. Yeah. So I think I'll add that in there. So if you go to smartbusinessrevolution.com, uh, it, it'll uh, have a page there where you can opt in to get my magic email template. So go there, download that. And then rise25.com is the other business. So the two are my two homes on the web. Sweet. Awesome. Yeah, good stuff. I definitely want to see those templates. So I'll be opting in <laughs> myself cool. for sure. Thank you, sir. Awesome. John, no, thank you. And uh, this has been a good time and hope to see you. And definitely we'll try to make it out there in a couple of weeks here. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. All right. See ya. Bye. All right. Thank you. And I hope you just enjoyed this episode you just listened to. Now, right now, before we sign off, I have a few things I would love for you to do. So the very first thing is to go find our guest on Facebook and tell them that you loved their episode with us. That's going to help them uh, just feel good about themselves, but also uh, it's going to spread the word a little bit more for us. So go find them on Facebook. Everybody's on Facebook and go say that you love their episode and maybe one cool thing that you learned there. The second thing is to go to iTunes and subscribe to our podcast. Just look up Hustle and Flow Chart and hit the subscribe button. And the very last thing, the third thing is to leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this podcast and help us spread the word more. That's how more people are going to get uh, this awesome knowledge, this, this cool podcast training and a whole bunch of other cool free training that we give out at evergreenprofits.com. So that's about it. Go find them on Facebook, go subscribe on iTunes and leave us a review. You would be amazing if you did that, but you're always amazing. So thanks for listening and we'll catch you in the next episode.